Well, hello once again. This is presentation number three of the 18-part series, which is Misinterpreted Texts on the State of the Dead, or we might say Misunderstood Texts on the State of the Dead. The title of our study today is A Thief and a Witch. Before we begin, we want to ask the Lord's blessing, so please bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, as we study this very important subject, we ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit. Open our minds, open our hearts, empower us to live for you in these last days of human history. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. When Jesus was crucified, two criminals were crucified along with him, one on each side. Let's read about it in Luke 23, verses 32 and 33. This is how it reads. There were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. At first, both criminals mocked and ridiculed Christ. But then one of them suddenly repented and rebuked his partner in crime and begged Jesus to remember him when the Savior entered into his kingdom. Let's read about this in Luke 23, verses 39 to 43. Luke 23, 39 to 43. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. However, the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Don't forget those words. The thief prayed to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now Jesus responded in a way in which the thief had great hope. In Luke 23 and verse 43, we find the response of Jesus and it says this, And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. I'm reading it just as it appears in the New King James Version, where once again it says, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, there's a big question we need to ask at this point. Did Jesus promise the thief that he would be with him in paradise that very day? In order to answer this question, we need to understand that the New Testament manuscripts had no punctuation marks. This is very important because there is some discussion where to put the comma in this verse of Luke 23 and verse 43. There are two possibilities as to where you can put the comma, which was not in the original manuscripts. The first way is to put the comma after the word the, and it would read in this way, Verily I say unto thee, comma, today you will be with me in paradise. And this is the way that it appears in the King James Version and all other versions that I consulted. They put the comma after the word thee. Verily I say unto thee, today you will be with me in paradise. However, the verse can also legitimately be translated by placing the comma after the word today. In that case, the text would read in the following way. Verily I say unto thee today, you will be with me in paradise. Once again, Jesus says to the thief, Verily I say unto you today, you will be with me in paradise. The comma would go after the word today. 
So where do you place the comma? It all depends on your concept of what happens when a person dies based on all of the rest of Scripture. We cannot take just this one text and develop a doctrine about the state of the dead from this one verse. We have to go to all of the Bible testimony to find out whether the thief went to paradise with Jesus that very day, or whether that day Jesus promised the thief that he eventually, when Jesus entered his kingdom, would be with him in paradise. Now one of the first things that we want to do is speak about uh, the place where uh, paradise is located. So let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verses 2 through 4. According to the Bible, there are three heavens. You say, three heavens, really? Which are the three heavens? Well, let's read the passage, and then we'll notice which heavens are the three that this passage refers to. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2. Here the Apostle Paul writes, I know a man, he's probably talking about himself according to commentators, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, that is, in person or in vision, like the Apostle John had visions of heaven, he was actually transported to heaven by an angel, doesn't mean that his soul left his body and went to heaven. It's simply, Paul is simply saying, I don't know whether this person went there in bodily form, or whether God took that person in vision up there. So once again, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. So if there's a third heaven, there must be a second heaven, and there must be a first heaven, right? Okay, verse 3. And I know such a man, probably talking about himself, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. So notice that the, these verses tell us that uh, this individual was caught up to the third heaven and paradise is in the third heaven. That's an important detail. Now, what are the three heavens? The first heaven is the atmospheric heaven where the birds fly, our atmosphere. We find in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 8 the following words, And God called the firmament heaven, so the evening and the morning were the second day. So God called our atmosphere where the birds fly heaven. That's the first heaven. What is the second heaven? The second heaven is the stellar universe, the universe of the stars beyond our atmosphere. For example, Genesis 15, verse 5, uh, God takes Abraham out at night and he speaks the following words. Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. So Abraham was looking at the starry heavens. That's the second heaven. And the third heaven is the place where God dwells. It's the place where the paradise of God is, according to what we read. So paradise is in the third heaven. Now, the question is, what more can we say about paradise? Well, the biblical evidence indicates clearly that paradise is located not only in the third heaven, but it's located in the New Jerusalem, where God's throne is, and where the tree of life is to be found. In other words, paradise is the place in the very presence of God in the New Jerusalem. You say, how do we know that? Well, we allow the Bible to interpret itself. The reason why people get all messed up when they interpret the Bible is because they don't allow the Bible to explain itself. They don't compare one verse with another. They get all stuck in one verse, and they say, oh, very clearly, the Bible tells us that the thief went with Jesus to paradise that very day that Jesus died. But you have to look at all of the biblical testimony to get a complete picture. Now, let's notice Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life 
which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now we have another detail. This individual was taken to the third heaven. Paradise is in the third heaven. And the tree of life is in the midst of the paradise of God. Not only that, the throne of God is in paradise. You say, how do we know that? Well, let's read Revelation 22, verses 1 and 2. It says, here John is in vision. He's seen the holy city, New Jerusalem. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So are you noticing this? This is taking place where the throne of God is, in the third heaven. It continues saying in verse 2, in the middle of its street, what city street? Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem in heaven. In the middle of its street, and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So the Bible tells us that this individual was caught to the third heaven. Paradise is in the third heaven. The tree of life is in the third heaven. God's throne is in the third heaven. And I want you to notice Revelation chapter 22 and verse 14. Clearly, paradise and the tree of life and God's throne are in the new Jerusalem. It says in Revelation 22 verse 14, Blessed are those who do His commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Did you notice that? It says that the tree of life is within the gates of the city, within the gates of the New Jerusalem. So are you understanding where the third heaven is? The third heaven is where God dwells. It's the place where the tree of life is. It's the place where the throne of God is. In fact, it is within the holy city, New Jerusalem. So the conclusion is inevitable. If Jesus and the thief went to paradise that very day, then both of them went to the New Jerusalem, where the tree of life is, where the throne of God is. Now the Jews, during the intertestamental period between the Old and New Testament, developed an extra-biblical tradition that paradise was an intermediary place where the souls of the Old Testament righteous went before they entered the presence of God. Many Protestants today have embraced this view, saying that paradise was kind of a temporary holding house for souls of the righteous in the Old Testament who could not go to heaven until Jesus died on the cross. However, as we have seen from Scripture, the Bible clearly teaches that paradise is located in the New Jerusalem on the banks of the river of life that flows directly from the throne of God and where the tree of life is. If Jesus meant to say that he and the thief would go to paradise that very day, then they must have gone into the very presence of God, into heaven itself, into the New Jerusalem. But the question is, where did Jesus go when he died? Did he go that day to paradise? Did he go up to heaven to the New Jerusalem, uh, where God's throne is, where the tree of life is, where the river of life flows? No, he didn't. Let's notice Acts chapter 2, verses 25 to 27. Here Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost. You're going to notice where Jesus went. Here the apostle Peter wrote, For David says concerning him, he's going to quote now Psalm 16, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I might not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. Jesus is saying here prophetically, my flesh is going to rest in hope. Notice verse 27. For you, he's speaking to his father, for you will not leave my soul in Hades. This is a New King James Version. You will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. 
Now, I want to read the same uh, verse, verse 27, as it appears in the New International Version, because it's clearer. By the way, the New International Version is not a Seventh-day Adventist Bible version. It's a, it's a Protestant version of the Bible. So notice Acts 2, verse 27, in the New International Version, which is clearer than the King James or the New King James. It says there, here Jesus is speaking about His experience and is being prophesied a thousand years before. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope because you, that is Father, He's talking to His Father, you will not abandon me to the grave. Did you notice that the New King James says, you will not leave my soul in Hades. But the NIV says, you will not abandon me to the grave. So the soul is Jesus. And it's not hell where Jesus is going. He's going to the grave. And then it continues, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. Did you notice in this verse that Holy One is parallel to me and grave is parallel to decay? So we have a synonymous parallelism. In other words, it says, Jesus is saying prophetically, you're not going to abandon me to the grave, nor will you allow the, the Holy One, your Holy One, which is me, Jesus speaking, to see decay, because in the grave, the body sees decay. It is puzzling to me that the King James Version translates the word Hades in 1 Corinthians 15, 55 with the word grave. But in Acts chapter 2, verse 27, the King James translates the same word with the word hell. Why the inconsistency? The word Hades is equivalent in Hebrew to the word Sheol and means the grave. By the way, in a future lecture, we're going to dedicate an entire uh, hour to discussing the word Sheol in the Old Testament and the word Hades in the New Testament, which is the equivalent Greek word. So now we know that when Jesus died, Jesus went to the grave. And when He was in the grave, His body did not see corruption. Now, what was the day and hour of Jesus' death. Let's go to Matthew 27, verses 46 through 50. We know that Jesus died on a Friday. That's why Christians today celebrate Good Friday as the day of Christ's death. So let's read Matthew 27, verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus is on the cross, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Notice it's the ninth hour. Ninth hour at that time was three o'clock in the afternoon. Verse 47, some of those who stood there, when they heard that, said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with a sour wine, and put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again. By the way, Matthew doesn't tell us what he cried out, but you have to go to uh, the Gospel of John and the Gospel of Luke to know that Jesus said two more things after saying, why have you forsaken me? So it says, and Jesus cried out again. He cried out, it is finished. And into your hands I commend my spirit with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit or breathed his last. He exhaled, in other words. Now, what day did the thief make the request of Christ? Well, it was the very day that Jesus hung on the cross and the day that Jesus died. Let's notice Luke chapter 23 and verse 42. The thief said to Jesus, Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, Jesus died on Friday. Did Jesus enter his kingdom on Friday? That's what the thief is asking, saying, when you enter your kingdom, I want to be there with you. Remember me when you're there. Jesus didn't enter his kingdom the day of his death. You say, how do we know that? How could Jesus enter his kingdom before he broke the fetters of death and came forth from the grave resurrected and victorious? 
Jesus did not take over his kingdom until he ascended to heaven 40 days after his resurrection. Notice John chapter 20 and verse 1. John chapter 20 and verse 1. Jesus resurrected the first day of the week. He had not entered his kingdom on Friday because he could not have entered his kingdom, folks. I hope you're understanding this point until he came forth from the grave and he ascended and sat with his father on the right hand of the throne, according to Revelation 12 and verse 5. Let's go to John 20 and verse 1. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. What day did Jesus resurrect? Jesus resurrected on Sunday morning or the first day of the week. The Bible doesn't call it Sunday, the first day of the week. So I want you to have the chronology straight. Jesus died on Friday and he resurrected on Sunday and the thief asked Jesus to remember him when he entered his kingdom. Now supposedly, the way people believe, that day on Friday Jesus entered his kingdom, but really he didn't. He didn't sit next to his father's throne on the day of his death. You say, how do we know that? Go with me to John chapter 20 and verse 17. Here Mary uh, is encountered by Jesus after his resurrection, on resurrection morning. And uh, she re realizes that it's Jesus. And immediately she wants to touch Jesus. But Jesus says something very interesting. Notice, beginning with verse 17. Jesus said to her, and I'm reading now from the NIV, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. Now wait a minute. Jesus is saying uh, the day of his resurrection that he had not yet ascended to his Father. But paradise, that's where the Father has His throne. That's the New Jerusalem. That's the place where the, where the tree of life is found. So on Sunday morning, Jesus had not gone there yet to paradise. So I have not yet ascended to my Father, He says to Mary. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending. The tense of the verb is very important. It's a present progressive tense. So I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. So Jesus says, don't touch me because I have not yet ascended to my Father. And then he says, I am ascending to my Father. By the way, this is happening early on Sunday morning. Now, some Bible versions have contended that the expression, don't touch me, which is the way the King James reads, really means don't cling to me. Jesus was saying to Mary, hey, you can touch me, but don't cling to me. However, is this the case? This word touch is used repeatedly in the New Testament to describe the act of touching, not necessarily the act of clinging. The NIV is an example of this inconsistency. When it translates the Greek word hapto, which uh, is, uh, the NIV translates as cling, with the word touch in every single verse, except in this verse. So listen what, to what I'm going to say. This word appears 36 times in the New Testament. 35 times the NIV translates it with the word touch. Only once cling in this verse. Now, was Jesus saying to Mary, don't cling to me? Actually, he wasn't. He was saying, don't touch me. Let me give you some examples of the word touched that is used in other verses of the New Testament. We have, don't have time to look at all 36 of them, but in uh, Matthew 8 verse 3, we're told that Jesus touched a leper and the leper was healed. Does that mean that uh, Jesus clung to the leper? No, he simply touched him. We find that a woman touched the hem of Christ's garment and she was healed. Was she clinging to his garment? Of course not. If she'd been clinging to his garment, Jesus wouldn't have said, who touched me? We're told in Luke chapter 6 and verse 19 that the multitude wanted to just touch Jesus. Did they want to cling to Jesus? No, they wanted to touch him. We're told in Luke chapter 18 verse 15 that parents brought their children for Jesus to lay hands on them, for Jesus to touch them. We're also told in Matthew 20, verse 34, that Jesus touched the eyes of the blind so that they could see. Did Jesus cling to the eyes of the blind? Well, of course not. The translation should be, 
I uh, don't touch me because I have not yet ascended to my father. So Jesus died on Friday. On Sunday morning, he had not yet ascended to the father. Jesus had not yet entered his kingdom. So Jesus could not have told the thief, today I'm going to my kingdom and you can go there with me because it just didn't happen that way. Why would Jesus say to Mary on resurrection morning, don't cling to me because I have not yet ascended to my father if Jesus was going to ascend to heaven 40 days later? Does that mean that nobody could touch Jesus during the 40 days between his resurrection and we, when he actually ascended to heaven? The tense of the verb is very interesting in this verse. Jesus says, I am ascending. He says to Mary, I am ascending to my Father. He didn't say, I will ascend 40 days from now. He said, I am ascending. In other words, he was about to ascend to his Father. If Jesus had meant that he was going to ascend 40 days later, he would say, I will ascend to my Father. But he said, I will, I am ascending to my Father. By the way, it's first person indicative active tense. The morning of the very day that Jesus resurrected, he told Mary not to touch him, and yet his disciples touched him that very evening. Ellen White has a very enlightening statement about a short trip that Jesus took to heaven the morning of the resurrection. This is found in early writings, pages 187 and 188. Phenomenal statement. Jesus spoke to her, that is to Mary, with his own heavenly voice saying, Mary, she was acquainted with the tones of that dear voice and quickly answered, Master. And in her joy was about to embrace him, but Jesus said, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Joyfully she hastened to the disciples with the good news. And now comes the detail that most people are totally oblivious to. Jesus quickly ascended to his Father. After this episode, immediately after this episode, Jesus quickly ascended to his Father to hear from his lips that he had accepted the sacrifice. And now notice this, and to receive all power in heaven and on earth. Very interesting quotation. So when did Jesus ascend to his father for a quick visit? It was on resurrection morning. And what was he going to receive from his father? He was going to receive all power. He was going to receive the kingdom from his father, which he did not receive until uh, he went to his father on resurrection morning and then came back. By the way, this helps us understand a very important verse, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, where Jesus is going to give the great commission for the disciples to go out and preach the gospel. Notice what Matthew 28, verse 19. This is right before Jesus ascended to heaven, uh, 40 days after his resurrection. He says, All power has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He hadn't yet gone to his Father. And then he says, all power has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He must have been given all power before he ascended to the Father. He was given all power when he went to the Father on resurrection morning. Actually, a better translation of the tense of the verb, rather than um, all power was given to me, is all power has been given to me in heaven and on earth. The trip of Jesus to his Father on resurrection morning must be understood in the light of the first fruit ceremony of the Old Testament. In harmony with the Old Testament type, Jesus as priest resurrected as the first fruits. You can read this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Resurrected as the first fruits and presented himself before his Father at the entrance of the heavenly sanctuary at the precise hour prescribed. Here is how Ellen White described the encounter between Jesus and His Father on resurrection morning. This is early writings 187 and 188. Angels like a cloud surrounded the Son of God and bade 
the everlasting gates be lifted up, that the King of glory might come in. I saw that while Jesus was with that bright heavenly host in the presence of God and surrounded by his glory, he did not forget his disciples upon the earth. Now listen carefully. But received power from his Father. When did Jesus receive power from his Father or the kingdom? When he went to heaven on resurrection morning. He did not enter his kingdom the day he died. So, so it continues here. He did not forget his disciples upon the earth, but received power from his Father that he might return and impart power to them, that is, to the disciples who were gathered in the upper room. And then she says, The same day he returned and showed himself to his disciples. He then suffered them to touch him, for he had ascended to his Father and had received power. I mean, it's so clear. When you look at this from the perspective of the types in the Old Testament, the types uh, that we find, Passover um, and uh, unleavened bread and first fruits. So on resurrection morning, Jesus went to heaven. His power uh, was given to him by his Father. He was installed as King of the Kingdom of Grace. And then he came back to the earth breathed the Holy Spirit upon His disciples to empower them to preach the gospel. Incidentally, as we end this section, and I hope that you've understood everything that we've studied, in Deuteronomy 30 verse 18, we find a similar expression to what we found uh, that Jesus said to the thief on the cross. Here Jesus, or God, Jesus is actually the one because He's the one that's uh, leading Israel in the Old Testament in the pillar of cloud, but notice what we find here. Deuteronomy 30, verse 18. I announce to you today, he's saying to Israel, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. So he's saying today you're going to perish. The same Jesus said, today I say to you, you will be with me in paradise. So once again, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go into and possess. So where should the comma go in uh, this text that we find in the Gospel of Luke? Clearly from all the biblical evidence, it needs to be, Verily I say to you today, today when you're hanging on that cross, when everything appears to be lost, today I tell you, you will be with me in paradise. When that thief resurrects from the dead, he will go to the new Jerusalem in the third heaven where the throne of God is and where the tree of life is. No need, folks, to invent an intertestamental idea and take tradition over what the Bible teaches. Now we need to take a look at another story, the story of the witch of Endor. King Saul spent most of his time persecuting David, whom he considered his enemy, and almost totally ignored the administration of the kingdom. This allowed the Philistines to gain a great advantage over the armies of Israel because of Saul's negligence. And so Saul was losing the kingdom and he was desperate. 1 Samuel chapter 28 and verse 5 expresses Saul's fear and desperation. It says there, when Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. Now, there are several reasons why we know that Samuel did not come from the dead to speak to Saul because Saul is so desperate that he says, I have to find someone that is going to tell me what's going to happen in the future, whether God is going to deliver Israel as he has done in the past. So let's notice several reasons why it was not Samuel who supposedly, or the soul of Samuel, that supposedly came to talk to King Saul. First of all, Saul's desperation led him to consult the Lord about what to do. So Saul did consult the Lord. He used conventional methods. The Bible tells us that he used the Urim and the Thummim and he consulted prophets, but God didn't answer. Let's read it in 1 Samuel 28 and verse 6. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams 
or by Urim or by the prophets. So God didn't answer Saul because Saul had made a pledge with the devil. By the way, at this time, the Bible tells us that Samuel was dead and he was buried and that Samuel had cast all of the spiritists out of the land. First Samuel chapter 28 and verse 3 says, Now Samuel had died, and all Israel had lamented for him, and buried him in Ramah in his own city, and Saul had put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land. So notice that Saul had cast out all the spiritists and the necromancers, and today we call them channelers, because he knew that God did not answer in this fashion. The first reason then is very clearly that Saul consulted the Lord with conventional methods and God did not answer. So why would God answer with unconventional methods that he himself had forbidden? We'll come to that in a moment. Second reason why this was not Samuel that came to talk to Saul. The Bible tells us that the dead don't know anything. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verses 5 and 6 tells us, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. The dead don't know anything. So how could the soul of Samuel come and speak with Saul? It was an impossibility. Three, if God did not respond to Saul with conventional methods, acceptable methods like dreams, Urim and Thummim, like a prophet, why would God answer with a method that he himself had forbidden? Notice Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 27. God had forbidden this type of consultation that Saul did. It says in Leviticus 20 verse 27, a man or a woman who is a medium or who has familiar spirits shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. God had forbidden this way of consulting. So would God come and use Samuel to speak to Saul, a method that God himself had forbidden? Of course not. Notice Leviticus chapter 19, verse 31. Here God says, give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Do not seek after them to be defiled by them. I am the Lord, your God. Fourth, Saul knew that what he was doing was contrary to the will of God. And of course, God would not answer if an individual is doing something contrary to the explicit will of God. Notice 1 Samuel chapter 28 and verse 9. This is the witch of Ender, and we're told, Then the woman said to him, Look, you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and spiritists from the land. Why then do you lay a snare for my life to cause me to die? So, so this witch of Endor, uh, she doesn't recognize that this is Saul. She says, you know, Saul has cast us all out of the land. So if I call Samuel to come before you, which is really not Samuel, uh, you know, I'm going to be killed. Notice 1 Samuel 28 and verses 7 and 8. Then Saul said to his servants, Find me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her, because God hasn't answered him. And his servants said to him, in fact, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. So does Saul know that what he's doing is wrong? Of course. So Saul disguised himself and put on other clothes. And he went and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night. Do you see he's doing this secretly? He's doing it at a time when she can't see him real well. He's disguising himself. And notice what Saul says to the woman. Please conduct a seance for me and bring up for me the one I shall name to you. And then, of course, he names Samuel. Number five, the Bible tells us that Samuel did not come down. Samuel, the so-called Samuel, because it wasn't really Samuel, uh, came up. Now, if Samuel was a good guy, wouldn't he have come down from heaven? But he's actually coming up. Notice 1 Samuel 28 and verse 11. Then Saul said to the woman, oh, actually the woman is saying to Saul, whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, bring me up Samuel. 
What do you mean, bring me up, Samuel? Samuel was a righteous man. He died in the Lord. And here uh, we find Samuel supposedly coming up. Saul is saying, bring him up. That totally goes contrary to what the Bible teaches. Number six, this is really serious. Actually, the witch of Endor referred to Samuel as a god. This was the same lie that Satan told in the Garden of Eden. You will not surely die. Notice 1 Samuel chapter 28 and verse 13. And the king said to her, that is Saul, do not be afraid. What did you see? And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit. By the way, the King James Version says gods. The word is Elohim. The same word that appears in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning, God. So what she's saying is, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. Now wait a minute. Would gods be ascending from the earth or would they be descending from heaven? Clearly, this woman thinks that Samuel at this point is a god. That's the very same lie that Satan told in the Garden of Eden when he told Eve, you will not surely die. Notice Genesis 3 verses 4 and 5. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, that is the forbidden tree, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Number seven, Saul bowed down in worship before Samuel the imposter, the imposter, not the real Samuel, the imposter. This could not have been Samuel, because if it had been Samuel, Samuel would have told Saul, you get up, I'm a man just like you. How do we know that? Because when Cornelius bowed before Peter and wanted to worship Peter, Peter said, get up, you only worship God. And even when an angel appeared to John the Apostle on the Isle of Patmos, and John bowed before him, the angel said, worship God, don't worship me. So if this had been Samuel, Samuel would have said to Saul, you get up, don't bow down. Notice what it says in 1 Samuel 28 and verse 14. So he said to her, what is his form? And now notice. And she said, an old man is coming up and he is covered with a mantle. Does that sound like somebody who, who, you know, who's coming down from heaven, somebody that God has uh, glorified up there in his presence? No, it says an old man and he's coming up and he's covered with a mantle. And now notice, and Saul perceived that it was Samuel. It, it doesn't say it was Samuel. It says Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And it continues, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. So here we find Saul bowing down before this purported Samuel, which is not Samuel. It's an evil spirit disguised as Samuel. Number eight, the, the Samuel imposter claimed that Saul would be with Samuel the very next day. Huh, interesting. So does that mean that the righteous and the wicked all go to the same place? Notice 1 Samuel 28 and verse 19. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines. This is, this is the uh, purported spirit of Samuel that is speaking. It's not Samuel. It's an evil spirit that is uh, impersonating Samuel. So once again, moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines. And notice, and tomorrow you and your sons, <laughs> that is Samuel and his sons, will be with me. The Lord will also deliver the army of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. So in other words, according to this, the wicked and the righteous all go to the same place. That goes totally different than what the Holy Scriptures teach. Number nine, this is a very important point. Hebrews 11 mentions the honor roll of heroes of the Old Testament. And Samuel is one of those individuals on the honor roll. Now, notice Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 32. It says there, and what more shall I say? 
For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson, Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets. So notice one of the Old Testament heroes is Samuel the prophet. But where is Samuel? Did Samuel go to heaven? Did the soul of Samuel go to heaven? Absolutely not. How do we know that? Hebrews 11 verse 35, just a few verses below the one that I just read in verse 32. It says about these heroes, women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. So what is Samuel waiting for? Samuel is waiting for a better resurrection along with all of the other heroes that are mentioned in chapter 11. So Samuel is not in heaven. Samuel is resting in the grave until a better resurrection. The last point that I want to share is that actually Saul did not consult the Lord, and therefore the Lord did not answer Saul. Notice 1 Chronicles chapter 10, verses 13 and 14, which is the parallel passage to the one that we read, that we read in 1 Samuel. It says in 1 Chronicles 10, 13, so Saul died for his unfaithfulness, which he had committed against the Lord. And now why did this happen to him? Why did he die? Because he did not keep the word of the Lord. And also because he consulted a medium for guidance. But he did not inquire of the Lord. Therefore he killed him, speaking about the Lord and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. So he did not consult the Lord. So did the Lord send Samuel to talk to Saul when Saul didn't consult the Lord? Of course not. God would not use a method that he himself had forbidden. Isaiah 8 verses 19 and 20 tells us that God does not accept us consulting uh, spirits of purported people who have died and have gone to heaven. It says there in Isaiah 8, 19 and 20, And when they say to you, Seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? So in other words, if you seek after mediums and wizards, you're not seeking after God. Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony, that means the Bible, to the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. The Bible tells us clearly that at this point, Saul's perceptive abilities were ruined by the fact that he had made himself an ally of the devil. You say, how do we know that? Well, let's notice, first of all, 1 Samuel 28, verse 14, where we're told that Saul perceived that it was Samuel and stooped, uh, and he stooped, uh, and we're told that he bowed before him. Uh, it doesn't say here that, um, that Saul saw Samuel. It says that he perceived that it was Samuel. And of course, the powers of perception of Saul were ruined at this time. Notice 1 Samuel 16, 14, he had been possessed by a demon or by demons. It says there in 1 Samuel 16, 14, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Who was this evil spirit from the Lord? Does the Lord send evil spirits to people using methods that he himself has forbidden? Well, he bypasses methods that he approves of? The answer is no. God allows Satan to do it. The Bible attributes to God what God allows Satan to do. But God is not doing it. God is not guilty of it. Ellen White offers this perceptive analysis of the, this episode that we've studied. This is in the book, Conflict and Courage, page 172. When Saul inquired for Samuel, the Lord did not cause Samuel to appear to Saul. He saw nothing. Satan was not allowed to disturb the rest of, uh, to disturb the rest of Samuel in the grave and bring him up in reality to the witch of Endor. God does not give Satan power to resurrect the dead. But Satan's angels, listen carefully now, Satan's angels assume the form of dead friends 
and speak and act like them, that through professed dead friends, he can the better carry on his work of deception. Satan knew Samuel well, and he knew how to represent him before the witch of Endor and to utter correctly the fate of Saul and his sons. The Bible tells us that Satan is going to use spiritualism at the end of time to deceive practically the entire world. We need to understand that our dead relatives are dead. They didn't go to heaven. Their soul did not go to heaven. Their soul cannot come back to talk to us, to encourage us. Because they're in the grave waiting for the resurrection when Jesus returns the second time. In the book, The Great Controversy, page 552, Ellen White describes the power of deception of Satan at the end of time. Practically the whole world is going to think that their relatives are talking to them. Their dead relatives are talking to them. Ellen White wrote, Satan has power to bring before men the appearance of their departed friends. The counterfeit is perfect. Let me ask you, what is a perfect counterfeit? A perfect counterfeit is when uh, the government cannot distinguish between a genuine $100 bill and a counterfeit one because they look just alike. So she says the counterfeit is perfect. The familiar look, the words, the tone are reproduced with marvelous distinctness. Many are comforted with the assurance that their loved ones are enjoying the bliss of heaven and without suspicion of danger, they give ear to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now somebody might say, well, how did this purported Samuel know that Saul was going to be killed in battle with his sons the very next day? Is the devil able to predict the future? No, he's not. But let me read you this statement so you understand what is happening. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 687. Satan leads men to consult those who have familiar spirits. They're called channelers these days. And by revealing hidden things of the past, by the way, do you think Satan knows all of our history from the past? Of course he does. He keeps a careful record of the life of every single person. So Satan leads men to consult those who have familiar spirits, and by revealing hidden things of the past, he inspires confidence in his power to, for, to foretell things to come. By experience gained through the long ages, Satan can reason from cause to effect, and often forecast with a degree of accuracy some of the future events of man's life. Thus he is enabled to deceive poor, misguided souls and bring them under his power and lead them captive at his will. Satan knows our history. He's able to say, th say things that happened in the past. For example, he can use a channeler and reveal information about a certain individual and uh, the people believe, oh look, that must be, uh, must be a method that God is using because he's telling something that only that person knew. But what Satan is doing is by an experience, by the experience of having the knowledge, he's revealing that knowledge to the person who is the channeler at any given moment. And then Satan, Satan also reveals his plans for the future. And by the way, not always do the prophecies fulfill the prophecies of the channelers and the necromancers and the palm readers. They don't always take place because God only allows Satan to work up to a certain point. Uh, Satan is able to predict what he intends to do before it happens. Was it Satan's intention to kill Saul and his sons the very next day? Of course. And God allowed it because Saul had sold his soul to the devil, if you please. And so the next day when Saul and his uh, sons were killed, people would say, oh, that person that spoke to Saul must have been Samuel because look, his prophecy was fulfilled. No, no, Satan was simply revealing what he intended to do. Let me give you an example. Jean Dixon, very famous uh, 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 prophetess, so-called, uh, several years ago predicted with amazing accuracy the assassination of John F. Kennedy. In an article in Parade magazine, on May 13, 1956, 
She predicted that the election of 1960, that's when Kennedy was elected, by the way, would be dominated by labor and won by a Democrat. That's exactly what happened. She went on to predict that the winner of the election, which was John F. Kennedy, would go on to be assassinated or die in office, though not necessarily in the first term. And John F. Kennedy, in nine, November of 1963, was killed. So people say, see, Jean Dixon was a true prophet because she predicted the death of John F. Kennedy. But really what was happening is that Satan was revealing to her what he planned to do with the person that was elected as president. God could have intervened and not allowed it to happen, but God allowed it to happen. And so everybody says, wow, Jean Dixon, you know, she must be a true prophet because she predicted the death of John F. Kennedy. In the present, Satan uses supposed angels, channelers, astrologers, crystal ball gazers, palm readers, psychics, counterfeit Virgin Marys, and supposed spirits of dead saints, because Satan knows that these methods are entirely under his control. You know, when you believe that the dead aren't dead, you will be deceived by Satan, because Satan can do things, uh, amazing things, before our very eyes. He can make it, uh, his spirits disguise themselves as relatives uh, uh, that departed, he's able to give information about them, he's able to tell a few things that'll happen in the future, of course God doesn't always allow it to happen, and that way the world uh, goes by the authority of all of these entities that I mentioned, instead of going by what the Bible says. What if my mother appeared to me, let me rephrase that, a woman disguised as my mother appeared to me and spoke with the same voice, had the same look, knew things that only my mother knew about me and said, oh son, it's so nice to see you. And, and she appeals to, to my emotions and my feelings. What should I do? Should I say, oh mother, it's so nice to see you here. Absolutely not. You know what I would say? I would say, the Bible teaches that the living know that they will die, but the dead know absolutely nothing. You are not my mother. You might look like her. You might talk like her. You might know things that only she knew, but you are not my mother because I live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And the Bible tells us that the dead don't know anything. So folks, let's be very careful about using these methods that God has forbidden, let's go by what the Bible teaches.